Here's problem number three from the 2011 AP Calc AB exam. This is form B, so it's the second version of the exam. And it's an area volume question. They start by defining a region in the coordinate plane. It's the region between the graph of f of x and g of x, and also bounded by the x-axis. So they've already given you the region R graphed over here. And in part A, they want you to find the area of R. Now there are two different ways you can go about part A. If you use a vertical slice, like I'm drawing right here, a vertical slice is going to have its top on the square root graph and its bottom on the x-axis, as long as I draw it to the left of this vertical line. But if I draw it to the right of the vertical line, now the top of my vertical slice is on the line and the bottom is on the x-axis. Because I have two different types of vertical slices, depending on where I draw them on either side of this vertical line, this intersection point, I'd have to use two different integrals to find the area and add the results together. So I'd basically have to find the area here with an integral, and then I'd have to find the area to the right of that vertical line with a separate integral. If you only want to do one integral, change the orientation of your slice. Do a horizontal slice, because the right edge of every horizontal slice you could draw is on the line, and the left edge is on the curve. So when you draw your horizontal slice and try to label its dimensions, the height of the horizontal slice is going to be a tiny difference in y values, the height of it in the coordinate plane is a tiny, tiny vertical dimension. And then the width of this is going to be a difference in x values. It's a horizontal dimension. We need to specify it to be positive, so we need to take the x value that's further to the right, the bigger x value, and subtract the smaller x value from it, the x value that's further to the left. The one catch is that you don't really know what this line is given as by an x value or what this curve is given as as an x value. So if you take f of x and solve it for x to figure out what the curve equals as an x value, square each side, x is going to equal y squared on the curve. And then if you solve the equation of the line for x, x is going to be equal to 6 minus y. So you're going to take the bigger x value, x equals 6 minus y, the right x value, and subtract the smaller x value, which is x equals y squared. There's the dimension across the bottom of the slice. The area of this one slice is going to be given by this expression times delta y. If we want to add together an infinite number of those slices areas, we're going to let the definite integral do all the work. So we're going to integrate this expression. Our delta y becomes a dy. Our limits of integration, which are easy to mess up if you're changing the orientation of your slice, the limits of integration have to be values of whatever variable you have listed right here. So our slices are going to range with their y values between 0, the bottom slice that I could have drawn would have a y value of 0, the top slice would have its y value at 2. So my limits of integration are 0 and 2. The antiderivative of the expression here is going to leave you with this. And then you need to evaluate this expression at 2, evaluate this expression at 0, and then take a difference. And so if you just do the simplification, you end up with 22 thirds square units. In part B, they describe a solid, and they ask you for the volume of the solid. And they tell you that the region R is the base of a solid. So this is like the, the bottom of a paperweight, uh, and it's, it's flat. So the solid is coming off of this region toward us. And if we take a cross section perpendicularly to the y-axis, which basically means we have to take a horizontal slice out of this solid. If we take that horizontal slice and we remove it and we lay it flat on the table, what we're going to be looking at is we're going to be looking at a rectangular face whose base lies in R. So the base of the rectangle, or the, the longer dimension across the bottom here, has to lie in R. It has to be this dimension. And that's the same dimension that we had from part A. So it's given by the same way we labeled the, the width of our slice in part A. And then the thickness of this is going to be given by delta y. So basically, this slice that you see across the top of the thin rectangular prism corresponds to this slice in the coordinate plane. So using the same dimensions from part A, you get two dimensions pretty quickly. The width of the rectangular prism and the thickness of the rectangular prism. The only other thing you would need would be the height of the rectangular prism. Well, they've actually provided that for you. They've told you that the height of the rectangle is going to be 2 times y. So if we label the dimensions of a rectangular prism as we've done, and then want to approximate the volume of this one rectangular prism, we're just going to do the three dimensions multiplied together. 
And then if we want to add together many of these rectangular prisms volumes to get the volume of the solid, we're going to let the definite integral do all that work. So we're going to integrate this expression. The delta y becomes a dy. And then the limits of integration have to be the y values that all possible slices, all possible cross sections that we could have taken are going to range between. And again, the bottom slice is going to have a y value of 0. The top slice is going to have a y value of 2. We weren't asked to evaluate this. Uh, we were just asked to set it up. If you were asked to evaluate it, it would be a distribution, antiderivative, limits of integration, difference. In part C, they tell you that there's a point on f of x where the slope of the tangent line is going to cause it to be perpendicular to the graph of g. So the tangent line is perpendicular to the graph of g. So if you, if you think about drawing a tangent line in right here, it would seem like maybe this tangent line would intersect g and, and maybe that would be a right angle. We want to try to find where that tangent line is going to be on the graph of f. So if the, if the two lines are perpendicular, the slopes have to be opposite reciprocals of each other. So right here in the middle of my screen, I started by thinking about the slope of g. You know, here's the graph of g, and the slope of g is going to be this number in front of x. It's going to be negative 1. The slope of my perpendicular line has to be the opposite reciprocal of this. So I change the sign, make it positive, flip the fraction, flip 1, and it's still just 1. So the line that we're trying to find the location of has a slope of positive 1. Since it's a tangent line, the slope of the line would be determined by the derivative of f. And so I took the derivative of f using the power rule, and then I simplified that a little bit. The thing with the negative exponent, I moved it back across the fraction bar, and then I went back to radical form. I wanted to try to figure out when this derivative is equal to 1. When do we have a slope of the tangent line turn out to be positive 1? So I set positive 1 equal to the derivative, cross multiplied, divided by 2, squared each side, I got 1 fourth. That tells me the x-coordinate of the point of tangency. If you want the entire point of tangency, you still need the y-coordinate, so you need to find f of 1 fourth. Well, f of 1 fourth is just going to be the square root of 1 fourth, or 1 half. So the tangent line to the graph of f at the point 1 fourth comma 1 half is going to end up being perpendicular to the graph of g.